At the time that he encountered Jesus, John was a fisherman, along with his father Zebedee and his brother James. John was likely the youngest of the 12 men whom Jesus called to follow him, whom we know as his disciples. According to tradition and pretty reliable tradition, John also outlived the other disciples by as many as several decades. Although John was only a fisherman. And like the rest of the disciples, was judged by the religious leaders to be ordinary and unschooled. His legacy to the world is vast and valuable. It includes three short letters that bear his name. It includes a fascinating and sometimes confusing record of visions about the ultimate revelation of Jesus to the world. And it includes a brilliantly written case for faith in Jesus Christ, known as the gospel or good news, according to John. As we saw last week in his opening statement, John makes some pretty bold claims about who Jesus really was and is. Jesus, the eternal word, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word was with God in the beginning, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made, in him was light. That light was the light of men. All that in his opening statement saying, here's what I'm going to try to prove. Jesus, the eternal word, eternally preexistent source of life, source of light, source of truth. He also claimed Jesus was the son of God. God in human form, taking on our humanity, revealing the father. Full of grace and truth. Through the testimony of, of his leading witness, John the Baptizer, he claimed Jesus also to be the Lamb of God, through whose willing self-sacrifice, forgiveness, and salvation would come to the world. He claimed that Jesus was the Messiah, the chosen one, the fulfillment of God's promised deliverance centuries earlier. Now, in substantiating these claims, John himself was an eyewitness. For three years, he walked with Jesus. He followed him. He listened to him. He saw what he did. Of the 12 disciples, he was the only one at the foot of the cross to whom Jesus then entrusted the care of his mother. John saw the empty tomb. John himself was an eyewitness. He supports his claims, however, not only by his own testimony of what he saw and heard, but also by the testimony of others such as the leading witness I referred to, the rugged, prophet-like, outdoor revivalist preacher known as John the Baptizer. We looked last week at some of John the Baptizer's testimony. When Jewish leaders sent, some pre uh, sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask him who he was, he came right out and said, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the promised one. And they pressed him further and he said, he said, here's who I am. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way for the Lord's coming. And he went on to say, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I am not even worthy to be his slave and to untie the straps of his sandal." The next day, John sees Jesus coming toward him, and he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. 
I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. And I can just imagine John the baptizer on the stand. And the moment he says, I didn't recognize him as the Messiah, I can, I can imagine the opposing prosecutor coming up and questioning him about that and John saying, wait, I'm not finished yet. I didn't recognize him at first, but let me tell you what happened. In John the Apostle's words, he says, then John testified. That word that comes up time and time again in, in John's gospel. Then John, the baptizer, testified. He went on record as saying, here's what I saw. I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting on him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize water, God told me the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus. So I testify. I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Now, perhaps at this point, I need to offer a disclaimer. In case there was any confusion here this morning, I am not an impartial judge or jury member here today. Um, I believe John's claims. I believe his testimony. I believe the testimonies of those whose stories he tells. And I would stand here and add my testimony to theirs, to his. That Jesus is the eternal word, the son of God, the lamb of God, the Messiah. But I do not believe that simply because John's testimony is in the Bible. It might confuse some of you. But you've heard me in recent months take a little different look at, at, at how we talk about the Bible. And sometimes maybe we do a disservice when we just talk about Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's true. But maybe we don't remind ourselves of what the Bible actually is. The Bible is not a book that someone sat down and wrote. The Bible is a collection of historical documents spanning Hundreds and hundreds of years. It was only 1,700 years ago that these documents were collected into one book. Well, even more recently than that. One book that we call the Bible. See, I do not believe simply because John's testimony is in this book. To the contrary, like many other historical documents and letters written by eyewitnesses and those who spoke with eyewitnesses, the gospel of, according to John is in the Bible because in the first few centuries following the events he records, it was widely circulated and was copied and was widely regarded as a reliable record of the events and meaning of the life of Jesus. It wasn't written to be part of a book. It was written to give testimony of what John had seen. And as we shared last week, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is the, um, probably shouldn't have started that way. Uh, the Gospel of John has, has the oldest scientific as evidence, the oldest manuscript evidence of any part of the, of the New Testament. And it's all intertwined, but the Gospel of John, the oldest fragment of any manuscript, any copy of any part of the Old Testament, dates from the early 2nd century, the time when some who were students of John himself, whose writings we have, when they were still living, and we have a little fragment of parts of John chapter 18. And those who were his students and who were their students quote from John, and other church leaders into the 2nd and 3rd centuries quote from John. This is 
this is something that must be reckoned with as a, as a historic document along with, with the other records of eyewitnesses and those who spoke with eyewitnesses and those who wrote letters discussing the faith. The Gospel of John is in the Bible because in the first few centuries following the events he records, it was widely circulated. It was copied numerous times and was widely regarded as a reliable record of the events and meaning of the life of Jesus. Wow, you might say. Notice my inflection. See, I could say, wow. I could say, wow. It was the latter. You, you picked that up, right? Now, no one here would say it that way, right? Wow, you might say. Those are some bold claims and, frankly, a little hard to believe. Well, let me invite you as Jesus invited the followers of John the baptizer and as who was it Philip invited his friend Nathaniel come and see for yourself take a look and so for a few moments this morning we return to the courtroom where John follows the testimony of John the baptizer by calling to the stand many others who had encountered Jesus in those first days of Jesus' public ministry. Four different but related stories. We've read three of them already. I just want to read through them again and, and, and just remind you as we, as we go through the Gospel of John, I know many of you have read it before, but maybe you've not read it from this perspective that we're looking at it. Maybe you've not read it before, thinking of it as a courtroom, thinking of it as John presenting this case. Maybe you've read it just as a collection of events and stories about Jesus. But I think it's going to come alive in maybe some new ways and, and lead us to some either, even deeper understandings as we, as we take this journey together. So let's go back to the courtroom and pick up the story where, where John the baptizer has just given his testimony. And John the apostle, the one who recorded all of this, in verse 35 of chapter 1 says, The following day, John the baptizer, that rugged prophet-like character, John the baptizer was again standing with two of his disciples, as Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they left John. They followed Jesus. That was their initial response. And now, through the Apostle John, we're hearing their testimony. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. And they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher. They said, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying. And they remained with him the rest of the day. Something about that initial encounter. You say, okay, well, tell me more. What, what do they talk about? What happened? Well, we're not told. We just know that they spent from 4 o'clock to whenever the rest of the day was. They spent that time with Jesus, a few hours at most. And here's the response. Verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John the baptizer said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, now this is Andrew's testimony, having spent a few hours with Jesus, having listened to the testimony of John the baptizer, Andrew tells Simon, we have found the Messiah. <clears throat> All right, put it on page seven of the newspaper. Right? Hardly. 
In every Jewish home for how many centuries had they been looking forward to this one who'd been promised? Andrew, a couple hours with Jesus, comes to Simon and says, we found him, he's here. We found the Messiah, the Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Rock. Already we see the response, the testimony of those who have encountered Jesus and the conviction with which they, they shared with others, with their family members, that this is the one. Their experience of him, one who knew them, knew all about them and still invited them to follow. Verse 43, the second story. Got some new witnesses coming to the stand. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathaniel and listened to Philip's testimony. His encounter was perhaps even Shorter than that, of, than that of Andrew and whoever else Andrew was with. Maybe he'd heard Andrew's testimony already. When Jesus called him to follow him, he went, he went to Nathanael and said, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets rose, wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathaniel's a little harder to sell. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel. Anything good come from there? You're kidding, aren't you? The Messiah coming from Nazareth? We could probably all, each one of us, have our own Nazareth response. We play that same game too, don't we? Where there are areas we love to live in, there are areas we never want to live in, and we make judgments about towns and regions of the country or the world or whatever it might be. And for Nathaniel, Nazareth was one of those places that nobody, nothing of value would ever come from there. Philip didn't argue with him. He simply said, come see for yourself. As they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. I think there was truth in what Jesus said. Can you be a man of integrity and still have some blind spots in your attitudes towards other people, towards Nazareth of the world and Jesus found something true to commend in Nathaniel. Some suggest a translation, a man in whom there is nothing false, nothing fake, nothing, no pretense. That's a nice way of saying he speaks his mind, <laughs> which he did, right? Nathaniel responds, how do you know about me? Jesus said, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Well, that would get your attention. <laughs> and it got Nathaniel's attention. And he exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I've told you? that I saw you under the fig tree, you'll see greater things than this, and goes on to say, I'll tell you the truth, you will, see all, you will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, who is the stairway between heaven and earth. I'm not going to claim to understand all that Jesus was saying there to Nathaniel, or even a part of it, but uh, you reflect on it, maybe you can come back and tell me what that, that rich and mysterious verse means. 
But we're going to move on quickly. We've heard the testimony of, of Simon, or of Andrew first, and then Simon Peter as he came, of, of Philip, of Nathaniel. And we move to chapter 2, and we get that strange story that was read before the offering. Well, what's that all about? A story about turning water into wine. It's been the source of a lot of jokes, like the minister who was caught with alcohol in his car, and when the officer called him to account about it, he said, oh my goodness, he's done it again. <laughs> Claiming that it was water when he started driving. Yeah, some of you didn't get that the first time around. It's, it's all right. But I don't know that I've ever heard that scripture read before the offering. Well, part of that was just so you could hear it so I don't need to read that story again and take that time. That, that's being honest here. But part of it was to recognize that, okay, as we give out of what we have, that's an act of faith, isn't it? It's, we're, we're trusting a God who will then supply our needs as we give away part of what we have. The same God who can take water and provide a need as relatively unimportant in the broad scheme of things as the embarrassment of running out of wine at a wedding that he can choose in a miraculous way to meet that need and we can trust him with our lives. Fascinating story. But at the end of it, John tells us why, it, why he included this story. He says this was the first of many signs that Jesus did. And his disciples believed in him. Another testimony of what people saw, many people saw. Oh, the, the, uh, the master of ceremonies at the wedding was just, his confusion was just, why would you save the best wine till the last? But there were people there who saw what happened, who knew. The servants knew. <laughs> they knew that they put water in those vessels, and they saw what happened. They knew. The disciples heard about this. They knew. There were eyewitnesses who saw it and gave testimony to what they'd seen. The last story is maybe even a little, more dis a little more confusing in some ways. It's a story that apparently happened more than once because we find it again after the uh, Palm Sunday entrance into Jerusalem in the other Gospels. But as John the Apostle writes, he says, It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers, their coins all over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. some ways maybe as unexpected a testimony as turning the water into wine to our ears and to our sensitivities. But John records it, I believe, because of the next verse. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from Scripture, passion for God's house will consume me. And they're connecting the dots as they're watching what's happened happening. They're, they're re recollecting scriptures from the Old Testament prophets and it's strengthening their faith and their conviction in what they see. They see Jesus having a passion for the intention of what God's house was to be. Other accounts have Jesus saying um, this, this place should be a house of prayer but you've turned it into a den of thieves and so often the church has, has read those scriptures and has said oh the big thing here is no buying or selling in the church property. Well, we can have that discussion, but that's not what I think is the biggest thing here. The biggest thing here is not what Jesus said, it's what he didn't say that they all knew. The scripture Jesus was quoting was, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. The Jewish nation as a, as a whole at that time had lost sight of that. And God was their God. 
they, like Jonah, were a little reluctant to, to recognize God's love and God's heart for all people. The disciples saw this, and it strengthened their testimony as they saw in the scriptures as they put together and they saw time after time how what they were seeing and hearing was lining up with what they, what they had known from the scriptures. Jewish leaders demanded a little bit more to this story. What are you doing? If God gave you the authority to do this, that is, Throwing out the money changers. Show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What they exclaimed has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days? Well, John the Apostle adds this comment. He says, but, but when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. And they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. And then John asked this little note, adds this little note, which is a transition to the next chapter. He says, because of the miraculous signs D Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. Interesting way of putting it. Sometimes faith is a journey. Sometimes it doesn't come all at once. Many began to trust in him, but Jesus didn't trust them. Interesting. Because he knew all people, knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was in each person's heart. Jesus didn't get carried away by all of this sudden affirmation, all of this, oh, Jesus, you must be the Messiah. He, he didn't get real excited about all of that response to a few miracles. He knew human nature. He knew what was in each person's heart. And you know what the very next verse says? Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Talk about knowing what's in each person's heart. He's our next witness. We're going to see that next Sunday. But for now, I want to close by fast forwarding to John's closing argument. I've got to go all the way to chapter 20 for this. And you're probably going to hear it a dozen times or more in the next few months. Right before John's what we call his epilogue, John seems to be bringing a close to all of this, all of this uh, argument, if you will, all of, all of these testimonies, all of these things which he believed compel us to consider seriously these claims. And John tells us exactly why he wrote what he wrote. John chapter 20, verse 30, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Are you not yet sure about this Jesus? Come and see. Read John's entire case. Join us here over the next few months as we examine it together. Open your heart to the possibility that it's true. Do you already believe? Are you ready to believe? Then let the words of our closing hymn guide and reflect your heart. Let them remind us all what believing looks and sounds like. Individually and together, let these words be our prayer. The hymn number is 562. This is not just a simple statement of, okay, I believe. These are words like, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. 
Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Let this song speak to us. Let it speak for us as we respond to John's testimony and his claims about who Jesus is. 562, will you stand as we sing?